Omaha Beach was a critical link between the Cotentin Peninsula and the flat plain in front of Caen. The terrain was difficult. It was unlike any of the other assault beaches in Normandy. Its crescent curve and unusual assortment of bluffs, cliffs, and draws were immediately recognizable from the sea. It was the most defensible beach chosen for D-Day. For that reason, the experienced 1st Infantry Division was tasked to land there, along with the 29th Infantry Division. The high ground commanded all approaches to the beach from the sea and tidal flats. Moreover, any advance made by the U.S. troops from the beach would be limited to narrow passages between the bluffs. The objective was for the beach defenses to be cleared in two hours, whereupon the assault sections were to reorganize, continuing the battle in battalion formations. By the end of the day, the forces at Omaha were to have established a bridgehead eight kilometers deep and link up with the British 50th Division at Gold Beach. The assault troops had been led to believe that they would face second-rate troops. The recently activated but formidable 352nd Infantry Division was relocated from Saint-Lô to Omaha as part of Rommel's strategy to concentrate defenses at the water's edge. As part of this reorganization, the 352nd also took under its command three battalions of the 716th Static Infantry Division. The failure to identify the reorganization of the defenses was a rare intelligence breakdown for the Allies. Post-action reports still documented the original estimate and assumed that the 352nd had been deployed to the coastal defenses by chance a few days previously as part of an anti-invasion exercise. The source of this inaccurate information came from German prisoners of war captured on D-Day. Allied intelligence had already become aware of the relocation of the 352nd Division on June 4th. This information was passed on to the 5th Corps and the 1st Infantry Division headquarters, but at that late stage in the operation, no plans were changed. The 352nd contained a corps of 6,800 veterans on the Eastern Front. After the formation of the division in November of 1943, the troops were sent to Normandy. They mistakenly believed it would be a relatively quiet assignment. At first light on June 6th, a massive air armada that included B-17 bombers roared over the Normandy coastline. The bombers pounded German positions on the bluffs overlooking landing sites for two hours. German soldiers huddled in bunkers or trenches as deafening explosions shook the ground. The surface ships also opened fire at dawn. Targeting defensive positions along the bluffs that commanded Omaha Beach, the battleships Texas and Arkansas, supported by an escort of cruisers and destroyers, unleashed a deafening barrage that thundered across the surface of the English Channel. As the landing craft approached the beach, the battleships ceased fire and dazed German troops emerged from their bunkers to man their fighting positions. When the smoke from the bombers and naval guns lifted, it revealed the complete failure of the Allies to soften up the enemy positions. The B-17s, which had been designed for high-level bombing of strategic targets, had largely missed the mark and dropped most of their ordnance too far inland. As for the naval artillery, it had failed to do serious damage to the well-engineered German fortifications. When the invasion fleet was within a dozen miles of the beach, the ships began sending landing craft to shore. Whipped up by a 10-knot northwesterly wind, the seas swamped at least 10 landing craft during the run-in, drowning many of their infantry. The attempt to land artillery failed disastrously, and in all, 26 guns from elements of five regiments were lost. A special kind of sacrificial heroism was demanded by the duplex drive crews when, by a serious error of judgment, 32 were launched 6,000 yards from the beach. Each one, as it dropped off the ramp of the landing craft, plunged like a stone to the bottom of the sea, leaving pitifully few survivors struggling in the swell. The infantry was thus called upon to storm the beach without the benefit of vital armor support, which was intended to shoot open the way ashore. The few tanks that reached Omaha did so behind rather than ahead of the leading wave of eight infantry companies and one company of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Near the western end of the beach, Company A was right on target as it neared its assigned landing zone at Dog Green. 
but adjacent companies whose landing craft were pushed off course by strong currents were badly out of position. As the men of Company A prepared to go ashore, they did so without adequate flank support. Germans in the heavily defended Virville draw concentrated their fire on the isolated company. The entire operation began to unravel. Before the craft had made landfall, they were taken under heavy fire. One unlucky landing craft inexplicably sank a thousand yards offshore, while the troops on board activated their life vests and tried to desperately stay afloat. Another ill-fated craft abruptly disappeared in a violent fireball, the apparent victim of an enemy shell. When the Higgins boats made landfall and dropped their ramps, the horrific realities of combat manifested in seconds. Scores of men were killed and wounded in a matter of minutes. Those still on their feet struggled forward through the water. As they did so, they endured a steady hail of machine gun fire. Those who survived the enemy fire crouched behind anti-tank obstacles. Pinned down in a deadly interlaced field of enemy machine gun fire, Company A was out of action. To its left, Companies G and F, which had been forced off target by the waves, came into the beach together, an inviting mass of targets for the defenders. The remnants of the two companies inched their way forwards across the beach to the seawall, which offered a measure of cover but little protection from mortar and artillery fire. Because getting off the beach quickly was a paramount tactical objective, the men had been instructed to simply keep moving and leave the wounded to the medics. Obeying those orders would leave deep scars for survivors. As subsequent waves approached the beach, it was obvious that the entire assault on Omaha had turned into a nightmare, and nearly no one arrived at their assigned sectors. On the eastern half of Omaha Beach, which was assigned to the 16th Infantry Regiment, the landings had gone no better. Heavy currents nudged Company E off course, and it came in with elements of the 1st Division's 16th Infantry Regiment. Crouching behind the seawall, the survivors of Company F had lost most of their weapons in their effort to get out of the water. Company I drifted so far east it did not land for another hour and a half. The assault troops also experienced a traffic jam with their vehicles. Demolition teams had only been able to blow a half a dozen paths through the beach obstacles. The tanks, trucks, and bulldozers that had come ashore were trapped on the beach. The beachmasters halted further vehicle landings at 0830 until more paths could be opened. For the Germans situated on the heights, the beach below presented a target-rich mass of men. It seemed that the attack on Omaha was being handily repulsed. On the deck of the cruiser Augusta, General Bradley, shocked by initial reports, was of much the same opinion. Although the American landings on Utah had gone miraculously well, and the British and Canadian troops were making good headway in their sectors, the assault on Omaha Beach seemed to have degenerated into a disastrous and bloody nightmare. What's more, the initial casualty estimates were appalling and it appeared doubtful if the disorganized survivors would be able to push inland. Bradley was giving serious consideration at mid-morning to pulling the plug on the entire operation at Omaha Beach and transferring subsequent waves to Utah Beach. The principal problem in almost every attack on every battlefield is to maintain momentum. Every instinct, especially among inexperienced soldiers, is to take cover under fire. Instinct is reinforced when bodies of others who failed to do so lie all around. It requires a considerable act of will to persuade limbs to act, which have suddenly acquired an immobility of their own. On Omaha Beach, the 29th Division became dangerously paralyzed. The veteran 1st Division on its left performed significantly better. Indeed, most Americans later agreed that without the Big Red One, the battle would have been lost. It was individuals, not divisions, who determined the outcome of the day. Although the Germans possessed the capability to maul and disorganize the American landings on Omaha seriously, they lacked the power to halt it absolutely. Despite the near total destruction of the first wave below Virville, a great many men survived to reach the seawall alive. Wherever the Americans managed to gain ground, they were able to keep it. 
two hours after the landings had started, General Bradley was still receiving deeply gloomy reports, but the real situation was much more encouraging than the view of the beach from the ships. Small groups of Americans had already reached the high ground and began threatening the enemy strongpoints from the flanks. Companies A and B of the 2nd Ranger Battalion landed with the 2nd Wave and reached the seawall at the cost of half their strength and immediately pressed on to climb the cliffs. Staff Sergeant William Courtney and Private First Class William Braher of Company A were probably the first Americans to reach the top of the cliff at 8.30 a.m. When the Rangers gained the summit, they were too few in number to achieve a decisive success, although they sent word to a company of the 116th Regiment below to follow them up. In the next two hours, a succession of similar small-scale actions took place all along the Omaha front, driving vital wedges into the German defenses. Twenty-three men of Company E, 16th Regiment, gained the hill and began to attack the strong point, which covered the east side of the St. Laurent exit from the rear. Brigadier General Norman Cota and his 29th Division Command Group reached the beach at 7.30 a.m. with the 116th Regiment headquarters. Cota began to move among the bewildered tangle of infantrymen. He saw two men of his headquarters group getting shot within three feet of him, while his signaler was hurled 20 feet up the bluff by an artillery hit. A group of rangers had been huddled beneath the shingle bank for two hours when Cota appeared. In one of his legendary encounters of the day, the general demanded to know who they were. Rangers, he was told. Cota exploded. Then goddammit, if you're rangers, get up and lead the way. Cota personally directed the placement of Bangalore torpedoes that blew a hole in the barbed wire above the seawall. He was one of the first men who charged through the gap. Some 35 men reached the road to the top of the hill northeast of Verville. There, they attacked mortar teams firing at such close range that the tubes were almost vertical. There were now Americans behind some of the most dangerous enemy positions covering the beach. By 11 a.m., Verville was in American hands. One by one, the German strongpoints were being knocked out by determined action from rangers and infantrymen. Some German defenders surrendered after they ran out of ammunition. The few German trucks that attempted to bring more ammunition to the front were blown up by Allied aircraft attacks. The gunners of Strong Point WN-62 had to destroy their pieces when the battery fired all its ammunition and then retreated southward on their horse-drawn limbers. WN-69, defending St. Laurent, was abandoned early on June 7. The defenses further inland were significantly weaker and based on resistance pockets smaller than company size and strength. This tactic was enough to disrupt American advances inland, making it difficult to reach their assembly areas, let alone achieve their D-Day objectives. As an example of the effectiveness of the German defenses, despite weakness in numbers, the 5th Ranger Battalion was halted in its advance inland by a single machine gun position hidden in a hedgerow. One platoon attempted to outflank the position only to run into another machine gun position to the left of the 1st. Further flanking maneuvers were met with fire from two more machine gun positions. By nightfall, the Americans controlled the perimeter up to a mile deep beyond Omaha. All plans for a rapid supply buildup were to be sacrificed to the need to get more men onto the ground. That night, Montgomery and Dempsey discussed the possibility of landing all further troops planned for Omaha on the British beaches. The suggestion was never pursued, but the fact that it was ever discussed is indicative of the alarm surrounding the situation at Omaha. An accurate figure for the casualties incurred by the 5th Corps at Omaha is not known. Sources vary between 2,000 and over 4,000 killed, wounded, and missing. The German 352nd Division suffered 1,200 casualties, about 20% of its strength. While the Utah landings had gone as nearly in accordance with planning as any commander could have expected, on Omaha, the failures and errors of judgment by the staff had only been redeemed by the men landing on the beach. The events of D-Day also emphasized the limited ability of high explosives to destroy strong defensive positions. Rommel had been correct when he said that the war would be won or lost on the beaches. If the American line at midnight on the 6th of June was still tenuous, the 5th and 7th Corps had achieved their vital strategic purposes merely by establishing themselves ashore. 
It was on the British front where so much rested upon fast and ruthless progress inland from the beaches that far more dramatic strategic hopes were at stake. 